It is now 1-27-2021, and we are uh, just got finished with our pulmonary mechanics lesson and exam. Um, for the most part, the class did well. I had a lot of A's, a lot of B's, and I had some that not so good. Um, but that's all right. You still keep fighting, keep pushing, because this now is where the rubber meets the road for the respiratory therapist. ABGs, okay? Oxygen transport and blood gas chemistry. Today, we're going to embark on the blood glass, gas chemistry. Uh, I've been prepping you and priming you for this since day one. I told you that ventilation is CO2. It is respiratory, right? Um, it is ventilation. Then I said uh, bicarb, which is HCO3 that you learned in cardiac AMP, which is 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter, is your base. Okay, that is your roll age, your AKA uh, alkalosis metabolism. That is your bicarb. And they both work together to keep pH in the middle. Okay, today you're gonna, or during this lesson, you guys are gonna learn what the normal CO2 ranges are, what the normal pH ranges are, what the normal bicarb ranges are what the normal oxygenation is. And this is where we're gonna introduce the P little a O2, which is the partial pressure of arterial oxygen. We're gonna talk about what number means hypoxia or not. Remember hypoxemia is lack of oxygen or low oxygen in arterial blood. And then there's another term called hypoxia, which is low oxygen in the tissues, okay? Well, there's a range, uh, and that's going to be two different aspects, two different trees, apples and oranges. Ventilation and oxygenation are two different trees. I cannot throw apples at an orange tree and get oranges, okay? I'm going, there are two different things. You're gonna have either a ventilation prob problem which has to do with in and out, the volume that goes in and out. Uh, the uh, minute ventilation needs to be higher or lowered some. That's what you've been learning, the minute ventilation and uh, alveolar minute ventilation and all those type of things are leading up to today. And so if you have a ventilation problem, you fix it with ventilation. Either give them some more volume or make it go in faster or give them less volume and make it go in slower. That's how you adjust or fix ventilation, AKA CO2 problems, okay? If you have an oxygenation problem, you fix it by giving more oxygen, okay? Give it by giving more oxygen. And so that's, I don't want you thinking that you, um, that you know the two are the same. They're not the same. They're two different things, alpha and omega, I told you guys one group was my ventilation group, one group was my oxygenation group. Keep that in mind as we jump into the lesson for today, okay? All right. Now, I was expected to see more people in the school today, <clears throat> especially behind that last test. Uh, I'm telling you guys, it is very important that you are in, um, participating, whether live online or in the classroom, all right? Uh, live online is good, but in the classroom is better, okay? It just is, uh, but you know, we're all grown. All right. All right, so let's get started. I'm going to uh, first share something with you. Uh, showing you that your success uh, can go a long way, okay? Long way for your success. I started at Concord and I graduated Concord, went on to work as respiratory therapist in trauma ICU. I've done home work. I've done uh, long-term care, uh, ICUs, all of that, right? And I came up with an invention uh, at Regional One Health. And I've been nominated as the 
um, innovator or inventor of the month for my cold blue documentation app. It's an app that I invented that's been tested and we're still in the process of working out the bugs and going to roll it out, uh, go live really soon with it at regional one. It's something that is marketable. So if they start to sell it to other hospitals, I get a cut, okay? Uh, what you're gonna learn is intellectual property is not yours if you give it or propose it to a big conglomerate like regional one. It won't be yours. You're turning it over to them, but they go into a process or a uh, agreement with you to share the profits. So unfortunately it's a 60, 40 thing for me. So if they make a million dollars a month off of it, I'll get 40% of that profit. Okay. Forever. And so hopefully it goes, it's not gone there yet, but this is just showing you that you can get there guys. You can do more than just become a respiratory therapist. Okay. You can be more than just a respiratory therapist. So I just got this today. Uh, they just sent it to me today uh, and we'll see how, how it goes from there. All right, so don't think that this is just something to do. Uh, you know, this is something to do some breathing treatments. You need to take it serious and go farther than you can go, even better than me. Like I told you, I always see things that can be uh, improved in a hospital. All you gotta do is make a prototype, patent it, and then there you are. Most inventions and stuff like that in healthcare come from healthcare workers, all right? Because you are the one on the front line and know what needs to be done. All right, so let's get started with the lesson for today. Where is it at? Okay, let me see. All right, acid base chemistry. I'll be going back and forth with the PowerPoint and with the lesson plan. I opened up this yesterday for everybody to print off your own study guide that's already in the module. So you should all have went to that last night and started to look at this next module. If you haven't even looked at it, then you're behind the eight ball. You got to stay ahead of the game. Okay. Now, what are we going to be talking about? First of all, we're going to talk about the two ways that oxygen is carried, applying Henry's law and Graham's law, okay? Uh, don't forget, I told you, you should have a sheet that talks about your laws, all your gentlemen that have made laws, right? And then also you need to have sheets that have your uh, equations or your formulas or whatever. Make sure you have those things separate. So when, we, when you start studying your laws, you can go back to that one paper that has all the laws from A, B, C, D, E, and then 220, 230, 240. Keep them all because you're going to have a whole lot of different laws as you go, physics laws. We talked about Laplace's law. We talked about Poiseuille's law. All right, now you're going to talk about Henry's law. You're going to talk about Avogadro. We're going to talk about Graham. There's going to be times that you talk about Dalton, Charles, Gay-Lussac, right? There's a lot of uh, laws of physics that you're going to have to have down packed. Okay. So how is oxygen carried? We said that oxygen goes into the alveoli when you uh, make your intrapleural pressure more negative than the ambient pressure, gas goes in. Well, that gas then gets into the alveoli and exchanges with the capillaries and the parenchyma. Okay. Uh, but then when you say exchange, that's all we've talked about. We haven't ex actually talked about how it's exchanged, right? Uh, I mean, you know, the actual oxygen, you just jump out of the alveoli and jump into the blood. Well, how does it actually uh, transfer, okay? Or exchange, how will it carry it around? Once it gets into the blood cell, how does that blood cell carry it to the rest of the body? Okay, that's what we're gonna talk about. Uh, gonna talk about necessary information to talk about Dissolved, combined, and total O2 content. You're going to learn that oxygen is carried two ways, either dissolved in the, hem in the uh, plasma or combined to the hemoglobin. See this? Dissolved and combined, right? And when you add those two together, that is your total O2 content. The oxygen content in the blood is calculated by adding 
the amount that's dissolved plus the amount that's combined. The dissolved amount is dissolved in the plasma and the combined is combined with the what? What is oxygen combined with in the red blood cell? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Carbon dioxide. No, no, no. What does oxygen combine with in the red blood cell? What, what, what? Is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. The hemoglobin is what's responsible for pulling and attaching to those oxygen molecules so that it can be carried. Well, that's just one way. Combine is one way. It also is dissolved into the plasma. And there are formulas to find out both of those. Both of those will have a formula. And then when you put both formulas together, it gives you your total O2 content, which is another formula, okay? All right. We're gonna talk about the oxyhemoglobin saturation curve and the factors that influence it. Talk about the alveolar air equation. This is one of the biggest equations that you'll get in respiratory starting off. You'll have some that are bigger and more advanced than this as you go on. But this is your first taste of a large equation. And that is going to tell us the oxygen in the alveolar air, not the arterial, but the alveolar. And what is the letter? Uh, how do we signify alveolar? What's the abbreviation for alveolar? That you, that you VA. Heard? How much? Not VA. We're talking about just alveolar. When we're talking about something in the alveoli, the word alveoli is signified by a what? Because alveoli and arterial were two different things, remember? We said arterial was one way and then alveolar was another way. Is it a capital A? Excellent. Big A. Little A for arterial, big A for alveolar. Don't forget that because that's going to be a part of the formula. We're going to find out what is the actual oxygen concentration in the alveoli, not the ventilation, the oxygenation. How much oxygen is actually in that alveoli? We have a formula for, like I said, they got an app for that. There's a formula for that, okay? Discuss the causes of hypoxemia and the responses the body does, right? Uh, what causes you to have low oxygen? Well, what's one way you've learned in the last one that could cause low oxygen in your, in your blood? What's one, what's the term that, what's the term that can happen when the oxygen gets to the lungs, but don't pick up any oxygen, comes back to the oxygen, I mean, to the to the body void. That's a shunt. So that's shunt. one way. Good, a shunt, right? So a shunt can cause low oxygen. Well, what about uh, hypoventilation? Hypoventilation, if you're barely breathing, then eventually it could cause your oxygen to be low, right? You sit here and hold your breath, your oxygen will start to drop, okay? All right, uh, and things like that. And then what does the body do in response to low oxygen, okay? We want to talk about the four types of hypoxia and the ultimate results. And then three ways that CO2 is transported. But we, turn, we learn that oxygen is carried two ways. CO2 is carried three ways. You don't have to know those, okay? Describe the Haldane effect on CO2 transport. Describe hyper, hypo, and eucapnia, which you've already done that. Uh, describe the henderson hasselbeck equation. That's another large, not really large, but another equation that gives us the pH. That's how we find the pH with the henderson hasselbeck equation. All right. You're going to list the buffer systems and their effects. Buffer systems are if we come, become too acidic, then there's buffering systems in the body that kind of bring that acid down some. And then that's when we start getting into our ABGs, okay? That's when you start learning ABGs, the normal ranges for ABGs, what they mean, right? Uh, whether the ABG is respiratory issue or a metabolic issue, okay? Now, if it's a respiratory issue, that means it's a what issue? Use your AKAs. If it's a respiratory issue, that means it's a 
Ventilation. Ventilation or a CO2 issue. The CO2 is the problem, okay? If it's a metabolic issue, then it's a what issue? Not oxygen. We're not talking about, this is simply those two things I talked about. Metabolic, AKA what? Isn't what? it like that? Alkalosis. There you go. Alkalosis. Alkaline, like Rolaids. When you have indigestion or stomach acid, you eat Rolaids, which are, which are very alkaline. And there are alkaline tabs that you eat that bring the acid down in your stomach and kind of buffer it down to balance it out. Okay? So that's what you got to know. If it's a rest, if CO2 is causing the problem, it's a respiratory issue. Okay? It's either respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis, okay? If, bi if the bicarb is causing the problem, then it's a metabolic issue, right? Or if, the meta if it's a metabolic issue, it's the bicarb that's causing the problem. You either have metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis, okay? So that's what we're gonna learn. And then we're gonna talk about compensation because after this stuff has been going on for a while, the body's opposite system tries to compensate for it. You're gonna think about tug of war with pH being the flag in the middle, CO2 on one end, bicarb on the other end. They are both vibing for pH's affection, okay? And they can either compensate if one pulls her one way, the other one can either not do anything, which is uncompensated, or he can start pulling and that's become compensated, okay? And so that's when we're gonna talk about uh, those there. Talk about the stimulation of the central and peripheral chemoreceptors. The chemoreceptor question that I threw out on that other test, uh, if you read about it, you'll understand what a peripheral chemoreceptors do and what they respond to and what the central chemoreceptor does and what it res responds to, okay? Then we're going to discuss the normal control of ventilation and abnormal control of ventilation. See how ventilation is not going to leave you? That's what you do. Okay. All right. So you see, that's a lot. It's a lot for this. These next three days are very important. You got a uh, lecture today, the next day, the next day, then test, just like every other one. So you need to be available. You need to be coming to tutoring. Uh, we've been having tutoring every Tuesday and Thursday at 10 a.m. Having anybody to ask me, hey, can I be on tutoring this Thursday or can I be in tutoring this Tuesday? Nobody. Okay. And so when you start saying, I'm failing, I don't know why I'm failing, but you've never come to tutoring or reached out about tutoring, then, I mean, it's not on the school, it's on you. You have to take that extra step because if you can't do those times, you say, hey, I want a tutor, but I can't do those times. We'll work out a time for you, but you have to communicate. I can't guess uh, that you can't do it, okay? All right, so let's get started. Let me see what this PowerPoint looks like. Let's do a slideshow. All right. Acid based chemistry and O2 and CO2 transport. I'm going to start off with O2 and, and, and O2 transport. It's going to be the first thing we're going to talk about is oxygen transport. Well, we know that oxygen is transported uh, through the respiration, right? Either internal or external respiration, all right? But it's carried in two different ways. The first way is dissolved in the plasma. Dissolved in the plasma. Now, Henry's law says, the weight of a gas dissolving in a liquid is proportional to the partial pressure of the gas, okay? The weight of the gas is proportional to the partial pressure of the gas. So it will kind of just ooze into or dissolve down into the plasma, okay? Dissolved in the plasma. First two ways. Number one, dissolved in the plasma, All right? Then we talk about the solubility coefficient for oxygen. Solubility, how does oxygen, how much, how soluble is oxygen? It says 0.0023 mLs of oxygen can be dissolved in one mL 
of plasma at regular body temperature and regular barometric pressure. That 760 millimeters of mercury, that's barometric pressure. Anybody ever heard of the barometric pressure? That's the pressure at sea level. At sea level, the gases in the atmosphere exert a pressure. And when you add them up, it's 760 millimeters of mercury. That's how much pressure is around you right now as you're sitting wherever you are. At sea level, it's the pressure. As you go up really high, like in Denver or Mount Everest, the pressure is lighter, right? It's not as much up there. That's why you have to pull harder just to get a breath when you're up high, okay? That's why you're in a plane and they lose compression. You can't breathe because you're 30,000 feet in the air where the air pressure or barometric pressure is very, very low. And that means you're going to have to suck. Remember, you have to, uh, your intrapleural pressure has to be lower than ambient. And if you go up in 37,000 feet and the plane loses its pressurization, then now you have to really get low because the ambient pressure is super low. Okay. And now you're going to have to get lower. It's like, it's like how low can you go, right? You got to get lower than outside in order for that gas to go in, right? If not, you, you're struggling. That's why they have oxygen masks that drop down so you can get that oxygen, okay? Because if you can't suck it in, you can't get the oxygen, all right? So for every 0 0.0023 mLs of oxygen can be dissolved in one mL of plasma at 37 degrees Celsius and a regular barometric pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury. This allows us to determine how much oxygen is actually dissolved in mLs? Here is the formula. The formula is P little a O2 of 100 millimeters of oxygen equals this, 0.3 mLs of oxygen dissolved in the O2. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, 0.3 mLs of dissolved oxygen. So here's the formula right here. This is the formula. 0 0.003 times the P little a O2, whatever the P little a O2 is, which you find in the ABG. The P little a O2 is a, is a value that you will find in the ABG when you stick the blood and run it. P little a O2 is one of the values. You take that value, multiply it by 0 0.003, and that's how much oxygen is dissolved in the plasma. Okay, so they're showing you an example. If somebody, Mr. Smith, has a P little a O2 of 100 millimeters of mercury, well, then his dissolved amount is 0.3 mLs because 0 0.003 times 100 gives you 0.3, okay? This is another link right here that can help you understand that. You can go to that and it will take you to the link. Yes. Oxygen dissolved in the plasma. All right, so let's look at a couple. Look at a couple and let's find out how much oxygen was actually dissolved in Mr. Smith's plasma. All right, so if these are the, um, first I'm going to show you guys the uh, values from the ABGs, and then you have to pull the, the what you need for the formula, okay? You want to pull what you need from the formula. All right. These are the normal values in a, since you, I'm giving you some values for, and I'm gonna give you numbers, I'm just gonna give you the value or, or the, the actual unit. In an ABG, which is an arter arterial blood gas, okay, arterial blood gas, you have pH, you have P 
a little a CO2, you have uh, HCO3, and you have P little a O2. Okay, these are your basic ABG parameters, which are in that module. Hopefully, you've been looking and reading, and you saw it, and you kind of got a good feel of. Have you seen this before? Okay, if you looked at it last night, you've seen this before. All right. The pH is simply the pH of the blood. The P little a CO2 is what? What is what is what does this stand for? What is this? What, what I say this is? Say the whole thing. Partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Into what? Arterial. There you go, because it's little. It's a little a. So it's a partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide. All right. So what is this one here then? What is this one? Partial arterial pressure of oxygen. Partial pressure of arterial oxygen. Okay. That's the P little a O2 in your formula. So dissolve. In plasma, O2 dissolved in plasma is 0 0.003 times the P little a O2, and it's in milliliters. So I'm going to give you some values, and I want you to tell me how much Oxygen is dissolved in Mr. Smith's plasma. Let's say you have a pH of, let me get another color. Let's say we have a pH of 7.4, a P little a CO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury, a bicarb of 26 milli equivalent per liter, and a P little a O2 of 75 millimeters of mercury. How much is dissolved in the plasma? All right, so somebody say it out loud. Zero point two two five mLs. That's how much oxygen is dissolved that will dissolve in his plasma if his partial pressure of arterial oxygen is only 75 millimeters of mercury. All right, what about if you have these values? What if I got the same thing, but this time the PaO2 is 95 millimeters of mercury? Then what will be the amount dissolved in his plasma? 0 0.285. 0 0.285 ml. And then, like the, like the PowerPoint says, if he has a PaO2 of 100 millimeters of mercury, then his dissolved amount into his plasma will be what? 0.3 milliliters. 0 0.3 ml. This is the formula for dissolved in plasma. Right here. P little a O2 times 0 0.003. Make sure you have that in your formulas sheet. And the answer is expressed in milliliters, not milligrams, not cc's. I mean, well, cc's and milliliters are the same thing, but not milligrams, not kilograms, not pounds. Make sure you know it's in milliliters. All right. 
Let's continue on. All right. Now, another law is we talk about now is Mr. Graham. Graham's law. He's going to talk about how diffusible a gas is, okay? Because we know that it diffuses from the alveoli into the blood, right? Some of it gets across and then gets attached to the hemoglobin, and some of it that gets across dissolves into the plasma. But how diffusible is it? How hard or easy is it for that gas to get across that alveolar capillary membrane? That's the question. How easy is it, right? Is it hard for it to get across? Is it very, very easy for it to get across? Well, here it is right here. Graham's law, that's when you use his law. He says the rate of diffusion of a gas is directly proportional to its solubility coefficient and inversely proportional to the square root of its density. That's his law. His law says that the rate of diffusion, how fast a gas can go across the alveolar capillary membrane, how fast or how easy it can go across is directly proportional to its solubility coefficient and inversely proportional to the square root of its density. So this is what you need to know. Carbon dioxide is 20 times more diffusible than oxygen. CO2 can get across that membrane 20 times faster than oxygen. And CO, who can tell me what CO is? Cardiac output? Yeah, it is, but that, that we're talking about gas right now. Oh, okay. Cardiac output will be C.O. Regular CO, when we're talking about gas, CO2 is carbon dioxide. What is CO? Is it carbon? Carbon what? Monoxide. Monoxide. It's not two. Two of them is dioxide. One will be monoxide, mono. Okay? Carbon monoxide. That's what you get from exhaust fumes, house fires, right? when things are combusted, combustible items, when you breathe that fume in, that's carbon monoxide, and that will kill you, okay? When people die in house fires, remember I told you, the high majority of them don't die from the burns. They die from the inhalation. Smoke inhalation is carbon monoxide poisoning. And look at this. Carbon monoxide gets across that membrane how many times faster than oxygen? 200, 200. So that's why you die of it so fast. You get caught up in a house fire, they die fast because the carbon monoxide goes across that membrane super fast and hemoglobin loves carbon monoxide, okay? She loves carbon monoxide 200 times more than she does oxygen, okay? So when we say this word here, affinity, affinity means love, right? Love or attraction, right? Hemoglobin's love for CO, which is carbon monoxide, is 200 times more than it is for oxygen. 200 times more. So this is Graham's law telling us about the rate of diffusion. How fast can carbon monoxide go across that membrane and how fast can carbon dioxide go across that membrane? That's using Graham's law, the rate of diffusion. So when you have a question and talk about whose law talks about rate of diffusion, that's Graham's. Graham's law. All right. So some people will say, well, why would your creator make your make carbon monoxide, which can kill you, diffuse so fast more than what saves you, which is oxygen, right? We don't know that. But we do know I'd rather die from carbon monoxide poisoning than being burned alive, right? So that may be it. 
keep you from getting burned up. All right. You fall out and die before you get burned. Okay. That's possible, but I don't know. All right. Here's the second way that oxygen is transported. And here comes another equation. Second way got oxygen is transported, and here comes another equation. All right. O2 transport. Two ways. One is dissolved in the plasma, and number two is combined with the hemoglobin. Combined to the hemoglobin. All right, so let's look at it on the board. Number two, combined with the hemoglobin. What is the formula? The formula is, parentheses, 1.34 times the hemoglobin amount times the SAT. This is the combined to hemoglobin formula. 1.34 times hemoglobin times the saturation. The saturation is what you get on the pulse ox probe that you put on their finger. That's the sat, right? But that sat is not, is, is, is you have to write it as a decimal. So let's put this little star right here. Sat in decimal, right? So for instance, if somebody is 98% sat, what is that as a decimal? 0.98. To go from a percent to a decimal, you move the uh, decimal point two times to the left. So, for instance, 98% is 0.98 as a decimal. What about What if somebody is 75% sat? What is that as a decimal? 0.75. All right. But what about this? Because this will trick you sometimes. What if they're setting 100%? That's just a one. One. Two times to the left. So one, two is just one. Don't put point one. That's going to throw you off. It's going to be wrong. 100% is one as a decimal. Just one. Okay. All right. So let's find out how much is combined to, is combined to Mr. Smith's plasma. I mean, uh, hemoglobin. How much is combined to his hemoglobin? I'm going to give you some values, and then you plug what you need from it, and you figure it out. So here we go. His pH is 7.5. His P little a CO2 is 40 millimeters of mercury. His HCO3 is 20 four milliequivalents per liter is P little a O2 is uh, 99 millimeters of mercury and his hemoglobin is 15 grams. Okay. Now, I want you to tell me how much oxygen is combined to Mr. Smith's plasma. How much is combined to his plasma? 
Write it in the chat when you get it. I want everybody to work it out. Oh, I didn't give you it. Hold on. Is that is 100%. There go his sat. All that will come on your ABG except for the hemoglobin. So you have to get a CBC to get the hemoglobin, and then you have to get an ABG to get these values to, in order to work out this problem. So put it in the chat and we'll see. Let me work it out. All right. Now, combined with hemoglobin is usually written in volume percent. Volumes percent. Sometimes it's a little different on other things, but we're going pretty much volumes percent when we talk about combined to the hemoglobin. All right. So I'm going to work it out. And if you got this right, we'll see. We simply do 1.34 times 15 times one. That gives me 20.1 volumes percent. That's how much is combined to his hemoglobin. Any questions on how we got 20.1? If you didn't get 20.1. All right, well, let's take a 10 minute break and we're going to come back and do both. We're going to, I'm going to give you some values. You're going to tell me how much is uh, dissolved in his plasma, how much is combined to his hemoglobin, and then you're going to tell me his total O2 content. All right, so I'm, I'm going to pause and we're going to take a break, come back at two o'clock. So now we left off with two ways that oxygen is transported dissolved in a plasma, combined to the hemoglobin, right? And when you add those two together, that's simply the total O2 content, which is written C little a O2, that means total O2 content, okay? That's the content of arterial oxygen, okay? The total O2 content is, add them together. This is dissolved plus combined. And that gives you your total, which is also written in volumes percent. Okay, so now I'm going to give you some numbers and you're going to tell me what the dissolved amount is, the combined amount is, and the total amount. Okay? All right. So I'm just going to change, let's see, his hemoglobin is, let's say it's a little low, right? Let's say it's 10 grams. Right? And his C little a O2 this time is 60 millimeters of mercury, and he is satting 88%. All right, those are your numbers. Hemoglobin, 10 grams, pH of 7.5, CO2 of 40, bicarbonate 24. His oxygen is 60. And his SAT is 88%. I want you to tell me how much is dissolved in the plasma and how much is combined to hemoglobin. Make sure you put a use SAT as a decimal. And then what is the total O2 content? I'm gonna work it out too.
All right, you can put it in the chat when you have your three answers. I want to know the dissolved, I want to know the combined, and I want to know the total. You can put three answers in the chat. Good, Kelsey. You're absolutely correct. Good, Stephanie. Michael and good. We should be good. I thought I cut your volume down. Yeah, cut your volume on. Now you need to mute your mic. There you go. Mr. McCarthy, did you say I need to look at mine again? Or was uh, it okay? Are you okay? Cassidy, yours is good. Everybody that's online to give me an answer. Whether it's right or if you don't know, just type in I don't know. But I need everybody to participate because this is I can't leave anybody out of participation when it comes to these ABGs. Because about five of your oral questions, when you get to the oral exam, it's gonna be ABGs. Yeah, they give you a piece of paper. Yeah, you gonna have the desk clear. They give you a blank piece of paper, right? Whatever you want to write on. Mm -hmm. Christian. Well, let me go back to Christian. I didn't say that. Charisma, yours is good for total, but I need all three of them. Miss Winston, let me see. Where, where yours go? Good, good, Christian. Your your dissolved is good. Your combined is, is right, but it's your, your decimal in the wrong place. You got two decimals in there, okay? But you're on the right track, and then you just add the two together for the total. Okay, I'm going to do it over and, and check myself. Okay. Heather, yours looks, well, Heather, your total is off. Your combined and your dissolved is good, but your 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 total is way off. I don't know how you got that, but you probably just fat fingered something. Sydney, your 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 combined is right, but your dissolved is wrong, and your total is wrong. Shatower, that's your uh, combined. That's right, Shatower for combined. All right, Heather, good for the combined good. Hey, one second, guys. All right, so let's work it out. Put all the mod parameters here, right? All right, let's just work it out. To get dissolved in plasma, we simply would do 0 0.003 times the P little AO2, which is 60. That gives you 0 0.18. 0 0.18 is the amount dissolved in the plasma. 0 0.18. Okay. Now, combined to the hemoglobin, 1.34 times hemoglobin, which is 10 times the SAT, which is 88%, which is written at 0.88. That gives you 11.792, right? So you can do 11.8, that'd be fine. But I'll just take this whole 11.792 and then add 
the, the dissolve to it, and that's going to give me my total because all of it is simply my dissolve plus my total. I mean, my dissolve plus my uh, combined, right? We said my dissolve was 0.18 plus, so this will be 0 0.18, 0 0.18, and the combined was 11, let's just say 11.8. I add those two together. 11.8 plus 0 0.18 is 11.9, or you can say 12 volumes per cent. This will be my total. Yes. All right, we'll do one more, then we gotta go, we gotta move on. All right, this time your patient has these parameters. Hemoglobin is 15 grams and your P little a O2 is 80 millimeters of mercury and he is setting 93%. This time all I want to know is this. All I want to know. Only answer I'm looking for. you have it put it in your chat okay let's see here good okay Lori, michael is good stephanie i don't know how you're getting so much but michael in good Lori, good uh charisma good Brittany, good talisha good still not stephanie look at yours again Did I get mine right? Who was that? Kelsey? Let me see. Oh, no, Kelsey. Not quite. Is, is mine right, Mr. McCarthy? Heather, uh uh. Now, if I call your name, if I don't call your name, it, it wasn't correct. But they pop up so fast, I might miss it. So, but let's look at. Uh, I'm, about to, I'm about to do it now, guys. Stephanie, you got 378 volumes per cent. So, I'm, let's, let's work this one together, Stephanie. 
The answer should be 18.9 or 19 volumes per cent. That's the answer. Well, let's find out. Let me put 18.9 or you could say 19 volumes per cent. So let's work it out. Oh, Stephanie. Mr. McCarthy, I did the total. My bad. <laughs> That's what we want. That is the total. This is the total. Okay. Let me add the two together. Okay. So let's look at it. Stephanie, to find total, we have to add dissolved plus combined. So dissolve is 0 0.003 times the P little a O2. Okay, so Stephanie, what do you get when you do the dissolve? 0 0.24. 0 0.24, good. 0 0.24 ml. All right, Stephanie, to get combined, we do 1.34 times the hemoglobin, which is 15 in this case, times the sat, which is 0 0.93, 0 0.93. What do you get when you do that, Stephanie? 18.69. No, no, just this one. What do you get when you do this one, Stephanie? Hang on one second. Eighteen point six nine. How you getting that? One point. One point three four. Mm-hmm. Like one point three four. Right. Times fifteen. Times point nine three. I'm still getting 18.69. Oh, yeah, 18.7. I'm sorry. 18.7, right? Volumes per cent. I was looking at the wrong thing. So that's right. 18.7. Good. Now, when I add this and this, what do you get? I don't know how you got 300 and something. I put an extra number in there. I got um, 18.94, so 19. You go. There you go. Everybody understand that. Everybody see what how we got to 18.9. Combine, I mean dissolve is 0.24 plus combined, which is 18.7. You add these two together, and that's your total. Don't make it harder than it is, guys. It's just it's just algebra. Okay, it's just a, it's just a formula. Just plug it in and do the math. So those are the ways. Oxygen is transported two ways, combined to the hemoglobin and dissolved in the plasma. You learn both formulas and then you learn the total O2 content formula, which is adding the two together. Okay, so make sure you write those formulas down because you're gonna have to be able to do those on the test. And that's just the small stuff of the test. That's, that's you know, you got to master it. Don't let it go like, oh, that ain't nothing. But that's not the meat and potatoes of the test, okay? All right. Let's continue on. So here goes the combined with hemoglobin. It says hemoglobin carries the most oxygen to the tissues. All right. So that means out of the two, Good, Christian. Out of the two, uh, which one is the most? Combined with hemoglobin. Out of the two ways that oxygen is transported, the most oxygen is transported combined to the hemoglobin, right? So if they say oxygen is transported two ways, which way is the most? The answer is combined with hemoglobin. All right. The hemoglobin doesn't exert a gas pressure and so they say calculate by saying 1.34 times hemoglobin times the sat. This is the formula right here for combined. 1.34 times hemoglobin times sat. Now you may see HGB or you might just see HB for hemoglobin times the sat. Please remember the saturation is written as a decimal and not as a percent when you're doing the multiplication.
You don't see it as SAT. Yeah, yeah, you might not see it. I just put SAT, yeah. But SAO2 is the saturation. What does SAO2 stand for? S stands for saturation of arterial oxygen. Saturation of arterial oxygen. Good question. All right. <clears throat> now, now we get into what's called the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. Okay. There's a curve that is emitted. Let me see if I got it here. Okay. All right. There's a curve that is called the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve that you guys are going to have to learn about. All right. It may be in your packet. Uh, that you have. Let me see. I might have it uh, in here. I'm sure I do. Let's uh, let me see here. Let me look it up. I think you put a picture of it like in the module. Okay. Oh, let me look in that then. Okay, cool. All right, let's go to the curve right quick. Mute your mic, guys. All right, here's the curve. Oxygen hemoglobin or oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. It's a curve showing the affinity for oxygen that hemoglobin has, the love for oxygen. And sometimes it loves it more and then sometimes it loves it less, okay? Uh, so when we talk about loving it more, if it loves more, it's going, to, it's going to pick up more, right? It's going to pick up more. If it loves it less, it's going to let go or release more, right? It's going to release it. Now, where is it releasing or picking it up from? Where does hemoglobin release that oxygen to? Where would it release it at? To the what? Tissues. To the tissues. Okay, to the tissues. So when the oxygen comes back from the right side of the heart, going to the lungs, picks up the oxygen, right? The hemoglobin shoop, sucks up those oxygen molecules, right? Goes back to the left side of the heart, oxygenated now, and then goes to the body. When it gets to the body, it releases that oxygen to the tissues, all right? That way the tissues can use it, okay? And, uh, and, and thus far. Now, there are some things that can cause hemoglobin to love oxygen less or love it more. And that's this oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. Okay, that's this curve here. Now, it can look at the middle. This is the middle right here, right here. This middle line is the middle curve of hemoglobin. On this side, you have the percent saturation of the hemoglobin. And down here, you have the corresponding P little a O2. Now, P little a O2, sometimes it's just PO2, all right? Sometimes they'll just put PO2, okay? Now, the middle, when, when, when hemoglobin is 50% saturated with oxygen, what do you think the P little a O2 is? What does it say it is right there? What can you estimate that to be about what? 34-ish. I don't know. Look right here. When hemoglobin is 50% saturated to the middle, go down. About almost 30. 7-ish, 28. About 27 millimeters of mercury. This middle point is called the P50. All right. Write that down. That's the P50. The P50 is when the, P, the uh, hemoglobin is 50% saturated with oxygen. So at the point when it becomes 50% saturated, the PA little a O2 is about 27 millimeters of mercury. 
Now, when I say 50%, hemoglobin, guys, has four bonding sites, okay? Hemoglobin has four binding sites. So that hemoglobin is floating around in the blood and it has four binding sites. When it gets to the, when it gets to the um, gas exchange part, it will suck four oxygens, one, two, three, four oxygen molecules, and that hemoglobin is full, okay? It's 100% saturated at that point. But when two of the binding sites are attracted to oxygen, it is now considered 50% saturated, okay? So that's what that means. So at 50% saturation, the P little a O2 is about 27 millimeters of mercury, okay? That's called the P50 right here, 50. 50% 50 saturated, you go over to the middle line and the PaO2 is about 27 millimeters of mercury, okay? Look at what it says right here. P50 is the PaO2 at which hemoglobin is 50% saturated. It's normally about 26.6 millimeters of mercury, or you could say 27, okay? That's that P little AO2. Now, what can cause it to shift back and forth, okay? So write this down. Left loves, right releases. Left loves and right releases. So when the hemoglobin curve shifts to the left, it loves oxygen, right? It's going to love oxygen. Therefore, it's not giving it to the tissues because it's holding on to it, all right? But a shift to the right will release oxygen to the tissues, okay? It releases oxygen to the tissues. Lefty loves, right releases. And there are some things that happen that cause this left shift and some things that cause the rightward shift. Now, you're not gonna get it all from the, from the lecture. Make sure you read about the oxygen hemoglobin curve. And if you don't know exactly what page, you can always look in the index of your Egan's book and look up oxygen hemoglobin curve. And that'll take you exactly to the page where it's listed, okay? So what happens during this left and right shift? Okay, well, let's look right here. It says shift to the left. A shift to the left, we already said it what? Love, see, increased oxygen affinity means it loves it more. This means there will be a higher oxygen content for any given PO2 because it loves it, okay? A shift to the right, a shift to the right is a decreased oxygen affinity. So it releases, means there will be a lower oxygen content at any given PO2 because it just let it go. It released it to the tissues, okay? So lefty loves, right releases. Now what causes those things to go left or go right is very important, okay? Let's look at, let's look at a rightward shift first because we talked about uh, reasons why hemoglobin likes oxygen less or likes it more. What did we say? How many times more does CO2 diffuse than oxygen? 20 times more, right? Carbon dioxide attaches to the hemoglobin 20 times faster, okay? So look, hemoglobin loves CO2 more than it does oxygen. So if CO2 is up, that's gonna cause a shift to the right. Okay, it's going to let go. So look at this right here. <clears throat> you gotta look at me. If I'm hemoglobin and I'm walking around with oxygen, if CO2 come around, I let go. I release the oxygen and I pick up CO2, okay? I'd rather have CO2, right? I'll hold on to the oxygen, but if CO2 comes around, you can have oxygen. I want CO2, okay? Because it, it loves it 20 times more than it loves oxygen, okay? But what if it's got oxygen and carbon monoxide come around? then what's going to happen? It's going gonna, it's gonna to release everything to pick up carbon monoxide because it loves carbon monoxide how many times more? 200. 100 times more. So I look at, I always use this analogy. Say you got a, uh, a, a, a spouse. Say you, hemoglobin has, a, has a, a boyfriend that's locked up. Okay, he locked up. So 
she right now she's having to just deal with oxygen. Somebody who buying stuff, you know, just a, a friendly person, right? Oxygen's around, right? But she really likes CO2 more than she likes oxygen, but right now she got oxygen, okay? Well, if CO2 come knocking or calling, she'll kind of push oxygen to the side for CO2, right? But if the man get out of prison, when he get out, everybody got to go, okay? The boyfriend and the friend, they got to go when, C when carbon monoxide get out of jail, okay? He been locked up for a couple of years, right? Your number one love for whatever reason, out of town. They say he's been out of town for some years and you've been dealing with oxygen, but you really like CO2, but CO2, you know, not always around, right? But when CO2 comes around, you do kind of get rid of oxygen a little bit more and pick up CO2, right? All right, but if I got CO2 or she has CO2 and she get a call that carbon monoxide has been released, then everybody got to go. Clothes out the closet, you know, pictures, everything, all evidence of CO2 and oxygen must go because she loves carbon monoxide 200 times more. So when carbon monoxide come around, everything got to go, okay? So when we think of that analogy, look at this curve again. So a shift to the right, it has a decreased affinity for oxygen. She don't like oxygen no more because who came around? Carbon dioxide, see, carbon dioxide is up. So when carbon dioxide goes up, she gets rid of oxygen. That causes a shift to the right. So not only carbon dioxide, but, and that's, this, is, this is the way to make you, um, this is the way to make you remember it, okay? CO2 come around, she goes to the right. She releases oxygen. Hey, you got to go because CO2, I, I really like CO2, so you got to go. Not only does CO2 go up, but the hydrogen ions go up the temperature goes up and an increase in 2, 3 DPG. All four of these happen. So when the hydrogen ions go up, the CO2 goes up, the temperature goes up, and the 2, 3 DPG go up, that causes a shift to the right, which releases, right? Releases oxygen. You got to go. Sorry, you got to go. That's disulfide dis something, uh, something. Don't worry about it. That I, I forgot, but it's not that important. But know that all four of them go up for a shift to the right. All right, well, let's look at a shift to the left. When did she start loving oxygen again? When CO2 what? When he went away. When he went away, okay, well, I guess you can come on back oxygen, right? So oxygen, she loves oxygen all of a sudden when CO2 goes down, all right? So CO2 goes down, hydrogen ions go down, the temperature goes down and the 2, 3 DPG go down, okay? So a shift to the left as an increased love. Lefty loves oxygen. She got them now because CO2 is gone. So CO2 is down, temperature is down, 2, 3, D, uh, two, three DPG is down, hydrogen ions are down, all right? But a shift to the right, uh-oh, CO2 must be around. So CO2 is here, it's up, so you got to go, oxygen. Let him go. He, she releases him. Okay, and so that is what causes these shifts to the left or to the right. Okay, so when it moves from normal over to the left, you have a higher percentage. See, if I go from here and then I shift over to the left, I have a higher percentage, right? Loves oxygen. But if I go here and then shift to the right, I have a lower oxygen percentage, right? So that's how that's read, guys. So you're going to have to really look at that to look at it again. You can't just try to remember what we said today and have it. Make sure you study this lecture. Go back and look at it and know that a shift to the left is an increased affinity. It means hemoglobin loves oxygen when it's to the left. So it's going to hold on to it. But when it shifts to the right, that means it released oxygen. She didn't like it no more for, for whatever reason. And the reason is because CO2 was here. Okay, CO2 was up. Temperature is up, 2, 3 DPG is up, hydrogen ions are up. That caused a shift to the right. She released it. You got to go. And don't call me because CO2 is here. Okay? But just remember, when the ultimate person get out of jail or comes back, everybody got to go. Okay? It will completely combine with carbon monoxide and you die of carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay? because all four binding sites will be tied up with carbon monoxide and she can't 
pick up oxygen. She can't, she won't. You have to bombard her with 100% oxygen over a couple of hours in order for her to finally let go of some of the carbon monoxide, okay? That's why when they get in the house fire, what you see them on is a non-rebreather mask with a little bag on it, full of oxygen. It's giving them 100% oxygen. That's what we give them when they're in a house fire because we suspect carbon monoxide poisoning, okay? We suspect smoke inhalation and smoke inhalation from a house fire is carbon monoxide. And so they will be sitting in there short of breath with a non-rebreather, it's called a non-rebreather mask. I don't have one in here, but it's, I'm sure you've all seen it. It's the little mask with the little bag on it, okay? We bombard the hemoglobin with pure, pure, pure oxygen, right? And over time, the, the hemoglobin will say, okay, okay. And we'll let go of the carbon monoxide and pick that oxygen back up before you die, okay? But if you ain't treated, you die. All right, that is the oxygen hemoglobin curve. Don't forget the P50, okay? The P50 is when fit, the hemoglobin is 50% saturated. That's the P50, when hemoglobin is 50% saturated with oxygen. At that P50 moment, the PO2 is about 27 millimeters of mercury. All right. All right. All right. So, uh, what is it? I mean, you know, what is it called? It's a sigmoidal due to hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen at each of the four bonding sites. Uh, I said the uh, last site has the less affinity than the second and third. That's not really important. Uh, the steep portion, uh, minimal changes in PO2 will cause drastic changes in the saturation and total O2 content. And what's important is P50. P50 is where hemoglobin is 50% saturated with oxygen and it's normally about a P little a O2 of 27 millimeters of mercury. All right, we talked about the shifts. A shift to the right causes a decrease affinity, means right releases. It don't love it as much. It doesn't love oxygen as much, so it releases it to the tissues, resulting in a decreased saturation. But it's an increase in oxygen at the tissues, right? Because it released it. It released it from the hemoglobin into the tissues. That's what we want to happen. We want it to happen. We want that to happen so that uh, it will, it will, the tissues will get it, right? And so what happens is. We want the hemoglobin to pick up that CO2 away from the tissues and drop the oxygen off at the tissues, right? And that way the CO2 can get back to the lungs so that you can exhale it out, right? If the CO, if the hemoglobin never released the oxygen, you would never be able to use it, okay? It can get in the blood, but it's gotta get down to your tissue level. The tissues need that oxygen, right? So if your muscles don't get that oxygen, then your muscles are going to become hypoxic and start stop functioning, okay? So we want that release. We want hemoglobin to get around to that used up metabolized blood, right? Full of ox, I mean, full of CO2. Ooh, so hemoglobin say, well, since CO2 is around here, I'll drop this oxygen off to you, right? That's what we want, because CO2 is up, so it will take in the CO2 and drop off the oxygen, okay? Releases, and that's gonna be a, indicative of a shift to the right. So what happens with a shift to the right? Increase CO2, increase hydrogen ions, increase 2,3 DPG, and an increase in temperature. So when it goes to the right, everything's going up, all right? When it shifts to the right, everything's going up. Shift to the right. Everything's going up, all right? What about a shift to the left? Just the opposite. It's just the opposite. 
A shift to the left causes an increased love for oxygen, resulting in an increased saturation, but a decreased oxygen at the tissues. Factors that cause a shift to the left is a decrease in CO2. CO2 left, so it went down. CO2 went down, so guess what? It's a shift to the left. Oxygen, I'll take you on then since CO2 is gone. Decrease CO2, decrease hydrogen ion, decrease in temperature, and a decrease in 2,3-DPG. Now, this is what we want to happen at the lung level, right? When, it's, when the hemoglobin is at the lungs, we want it to pick up what? When the hemoglobin, which is in the blood, when it gets to the lung area, we want it to pick up what? Oxygen. So that's what we want. We want to increase affinity for oxygen at the lung level because there's more oxygen in the lungs than it is what? Outside. I don't know what I'm saying. And Between the two gases that we're talking about, carbon dioxide. When I take a deep breath in, there's going to be more oxygen in my lungs than it is carbon dioxide. And that means that's a low carbon dioxide, so hemoglobin is going to love oxygen, right? It's going to love oxygen because there's a low amount of CO2. But at the tissue level, there's a high amount of CO2 because that's the byproduct of metabolism. When your, when your muscles are working and burning glucose and all of that, that byproduct is CO2. So when the hemoglobin gets to the tissue level, it senses a higher amount of CO2. Therefore, it releases the oxygen and picks up the CO2. Okay, So it's a cycle that has to happen in order for you to live, right? This is how that oxygen is getting around. This is how CO2 is getting around, okay? CO2 is a little more complicated because it does it does some morphine, right? But it, all the same, that's, this is how it's transporting around, okay? So that's what we want. When that hemoglobin is in the blood and gets to the lung level, oh, it's way more oxygen in the alveoli than it is CO2. So all of a sudden CO2 is low. So let me pick up all this good old oxygen. It picks up the oxygen from the alveoli and takes it to the tissues, right? It takes it to the tissues. And when it gets to the tissues, it realizes, hey, CO2 is higher down here. So let me let go of the oxygen and pick up the CO2. Go back to the lungs, does the same thing. You know what I'm saying? It sees oxygen, it's gonna let go of the CO2 pick up the oxygen, and you want to exhale the CO2 out, okay? It's just a cycle. So this is what we're talking about, what I just said. That's called the Bohr effect. That's called the Bohr effect. The Bohr effect is the effect of hydrogen ions or the CO2 on hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. So the effect of CO2, that's what we said. When CO2 is high, hemoglobin will pick it up and release the, tip, release the oxygen. When CO2 is low, it will uh, pick up the oxygen and, and let go of the CO2, right? Okay, because if, if, if CO2 is up, it's going to take it. If CO2 is low, it don't. It picks up the oxygen, right? So that's what it's showing. At the lungs, what's happening at the lungs? The PCO2 is low. The carbon dioxide in the lungs is low, right? So that causes a shift to the left. And then since it shifts to the left, hemoglobin is going to shoot, shoot, shoot. Pick it up because lefty means it's going to love oxygen. So now it's going to pick it up. Okay. And that's what we want because after it picks it up, it takes it to the tissues. So it says pH is also increased in the lungs, causing the shift to the left with an uptake of oxygen in the blood. It uptakes that oxygen because when the hemoglobin makes it back, so this is the process, guys. This is the process. So you can see it moving. The deoxygenated blood that has a lot of CO2 in it comes back from the body, right? It comes back from the body to the right, I mean, the superior and inferior vena cava, right? Dumps into the right atrium, into the right ventricle, then to the pulmonary artery, right? This is hemoglobin in blood, right? Into the lungs. When it gets to the lungs, the hemoglobin says, ooh, the CO2 is low in here. So since the CO2 is low, I'm going to now love oxygen. So when it gets to these lungs, it's going to pick up all of that good oxygen you just inhaled, right? And then it's going to come back to the heart via the pulmonary veins, right, full of oxygen. 
and to the left atria, and to the left ventricle, then through the aorta, and to the body, to the tissues. When it gets to the tissues, it's going to say, hmm, the CO2 is high down here. So if the CO2 is high, it's going to pick up the CO2 and release the oxygen. Okay? And that happens over again, all over again. Okay? All over again. All right. Let's see what's next. Take another break and see what I got before I don't want to start something new. All right, so that was the, uh, we talked about the Bohr effect. That is the effect that CO2 has on, on hemoglobin. Okay, that's, that's when I say, what is it called or what is the effect called of CO2's effect on hemoglobin's love for oxygen? That's the Bohr effect. So you can call CO2 Mr. Bohr if you want to. Okay, you can call CO2 Mr. Bohr. When Mr. Bohr calls, CO2, I mean, uh, hemoglobin comes running. Mr. Bohr, he has a strong effect on hemoglobin's love for oxygen. Okay, so at the, t at the lung level, the CO2 is low. When you take a deep breath in, the pressure of CO2 is way lower than the pressure of oxygen in the alveoli, which you're going to learn in a little while, okay? Since that's the case, uh, hemoglobin says, oh, the CO2 is low, so I love oxygen. And I pick up all that oxygen and take it to the body. Now, what about the tissue level? At the tissue level, the CO2 is high because of metabolization, right? Because of your metabolization, the CO2 amount in the tissues is high. So when the hemoglobin gets to the tissue level, it realizes, oh, it's a lot of CO2 here. I'm about to pick up CO2 and release oxygen. So I mean, I have a decreased love for oxygen now, so I'm going to let it go. And I let it go to the tissues, right? I let it go to the tissues. It says pH decreases in that case uh, in tissue, causing a shift to the right, releasing oxygen to the tissue. That's what we want. If, that do if this doesn't happen, guys, if the Bohr effect doesn't happen, you do not gas exchange, okay? You do not gas exchange if it don't happen. All right, and I'm gonna stop at this one for the next break, but this is it right here, total O2 content, and you add the two together, combine with the dissolve. Here's the formula for total O2 content, which you should already have. This one right here is dissolved. This one right here is combined. You add them together, that's the total. CaO2 is the content of arterial oxygen. All right, we're going to take, all right, so let me share my screen. Let me go back to the lesson plan and make sure there's nothing that's been left out. Uh, and you can actually, you can go back and look at it and fill in anything. But I think everything is, is in here, but this was the oxygen transport dissolved. Um, and then talk about combined. This was the formula here, All right? It talks about the curve. But like I said, you can go back and, and fill in anything you missed. But I think the uh, PowerPoint, pretty much, I just took this straight from here and copied it and put it on the PowerPoint. So it shouldn't be nothing that you missed. But just in case, here it is. I want you to say that you didn't get it, All right? And this is the total O2 content is where we stopped at right here. Now we're going to talk about hypoxemia. Hypoxemia is the deficiency of oxygen in arterial blood. I mean, low oxygen in arterial blood. Okay. There are several ways, I don't know, maybe not several, but there are a few ways to find out if your patient is suffering from hypoxemia. Okay. There are a couple ways to find out, to, well, to, couple numbers. There are a couple numbers we can look at to see if is my patient hypoxic or not. All right. So let me do that so you'll know there's more than one way to tell if the patient is suffering from hypoxemia. Okay.
Hypoxemia is a low O2 in arterial blood. How do we check for hypoxemia? One way is the PaO2, P little AO2. You can look at that value. All right, and that would be P little AO2 uh, less than 80 millimeters of mercury. A low PaO2, a P little AO2 of less than 80 millimeters of mercury. Another way I can see if the patient is suffering from hypoxemia will be simply a SaO2, right? Is about, let's just say it's less than about 92%, somewhere around there. If they have a SAT less than 92, they're probably suffering from some hypoxemia. Okay. Another way. Their P big A O2. That's the partial pressure of alveolar oxygen. And it's less, when it's less than about 90 millimeters of mercury. Now these numbers here, guys, are not exact. I'm just showing you when this is low, when this is low, or when this is low, you got hypoxemia. Okay? And the last way would be my total O2 content. And for this one, we will say it is less than uh, 17 volumes percent. These are four ways. Four ways to see if your patient is suffering from hypoxemia. Okay, so that means you need to know the normals for all these values, right? To so look, because I might give you the total O2 content, ask you, are they hypoxemic? You got to be able to tell me yes or no. I may say you give you the P big AO2 and ask you, are they hypoxemic? You have to be able to tell me it's about to lead to it, yes or no. Uh, the set, are they hypoxemic? Uh, yes or no, right? So you're going to have to know these. It's not just one way to tell if they're hypoxemic. Okay? So, but the first one we're going to deal with is the P big A O2. Okay? The P big A O2. This is the Pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. If the pressure in oxygen of oxygen in the alveoli is low, you already know it's going to be low in the, in the artery. Because this is where it starts, right? If there is no oxygen in the lungs, it can't be any oxygen in the blood. Okay? So if you have a shunted lung and you have all the blood, but the alveoli is closed, then that means the oxygen tension in the alveoli is zero, right? If it doesn't have it, the blood doesn't pick up none. So you're going to have hypoxemia. Okay, so here's the formula for alveolar oxygen to find the pressure of alveolar oxygen. They also call it the oxy alveolar oxygen tension. Tension and pressure, the same thing. Tension and pressure is the same thing. Here's the formula. FiO2 which is a fraction of inspired oxygen. How much oxygen are they breathing in? Break room air, or am I giving them some? Times the pressure of the barometric, right? The barometric pressure, which is P-bar, pressure of the barometric, minus the pressure of water, because there's water vapor in your lungs. But when we inhale, it's, it's, it's moisture, right? But what makes the, the air moist? What part of your body makes the air moist before it gets to the lung? Yeah. Your nose. So you got to you have to take that out. I want to take out that um, vapor if I just want to know the oxygen tension. If I just want to know how much oxygen pressure is in the alveoli, I got to subtract 
the water tension away, right? Also, I have must subtract the CO2, PaCO2 divided by the respiratory quotient. That is the alveolar air equation. This is the alveolar air equation. Oh, you need your mask on. The alveolar air equation. That is the pressure of our, I mean of alveolar. Big A means alveolar oxygen equals the FiO2 times barometric pressure minus the water pressure or water vapor, right? Minus the CO2 divided by the respiratory quotient. When we figure all that out, that's going to tell us how much is in the alveoli. Okay. Now, before we can get to that, I like to go to this point to show you the pressures of uh, uh, what's in the atmosphere, okay? You need to know the gases that make up the atmosphere so you can understand what FiO2 is, okay? So I hope you got that because I'm going to have to erase it. You can pause it and whatever you need to do um, if you're watching it later. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Let's see here. I'll write that on this one so I can keep that one kind of big. Sometimes these markers are hard. Why does it smell like feet? Yeah, it smells like pure feet. All right. These gases I'm about to show you come up in your next lesson, but they should have put it in this one so you can understand what F out the basics of F out. Yeah, <laughs> All right. Argon point seven eight. Let's see. Hold on one second. Let me. I want to make sure I tell you the right thing.
All right. Trace gas. Yes, ma'am. All right. So, the gas is in the atmosphere, guys. Here for a minute, so you can see it a little bit better. The gases of the atmosphere. Oxygen makes up 21% of the atmosphere. Now, see, all of these make up the P bar, which is the barometric pressure. Okay, all of them together make up the barometric pressure. Now, what I will tell you is, and I'm not going to teach you this yet. I'll teach you later. Each one of these gases exert a pressure. Okay, and when you convert that percent to a pressure and add the pressures up, you get 760, right? 760 millimeters of mercury. But right now, all we want to concentrate on is the percentages. <clears throat> the atmosphere, the breath, air that you're breathing right now, if you're on Earth, at sea level, which is 760, okay, this is sea level where you are now in Memphis. The oxygen percentage is 21% of the atmosphere. The nitrogen is 78%. Argon is 0.93%. Carbon dioxide is 0.03%. And trace gases is 0.01%. Trace gases will be the farts of the world, which is methane. What happens if you live below sea level, like in Charleston, where I'm from, uh, they're below sea level. Is the barometric number different down there? It'll be, it'll be, the yes, it would be different. It would be different, but the percent of oxygen would still be 21%. Okay. Cool. But the, what's different is the nitrogen. The different would be the nitrogen level, be a little less, right? As a matter of fact, it might be even more. Uh, the barometric pressure might be higher below sea level because above sea level, way up in the sky, it's less than 760. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so oxygen makes up 21%. So this is also considered to be room air. When we say a patient is on room air, that means they are breathing in 21% oxygen, like you are right now, like I am right now. Everybody that's not on oxygen, that's not getting any supplemental, like in a nasal cannula or oxygen mask, if you're just breathing regularly like everybody else, you are breathing in room air, which is 21% oxygen. I ain't glare. It's a little glare on me. That says room air. I don't think you can see it. Room air. 21% oxygen is considered to be room air. That is what we're talking about. And so what I, what I want you to know that is because when I say FiO2, FiO2 is the fraction of inspired oxygen. How much are they, are they breathing in? If I say they own room air, then they're breathing in how much? 21%. 21%. So the FO2 on in room air is 21%. So room air has an FO2 of 21%. Okay? That's room air. If I if I tell you that FO2 is 40% then that, that more than room air. They must be getting some oxygen from something, either a nasal cannula or a nasal mask or some type of oxygen device, which you'll learn a little later. The devices that we use So the FiO2 is for room air? Yes, the FiO2 is how much oxygen are they breathing in? Not volume, just oxygen. The fraction of inspired oxygen. How much oxygen? So I'm breathing right now, and you're breathing right now. So what's the FiO2? 21%. Everybody under my sound of my voice right now is breathing in an FiO2 of 21% because you're breathing in regular room air. 
So the room air that you're around, every oxygen is everywhere, right? It's 21% of the whole atmosphere. You go outside, you breathe in room air. You go in your house, you breathe in room air. You get in your car, you breathe in room air. I don't care about the volume. I don't care if you stick your head out the window and blow your face while you're driving, it's still 21%. It might be more volume coming in, but the actual amount of oxygen is 21%. Okay, 21%. So that's why I did that so you guys will know what I mean by FIO2. Because most of the patients that we're going to talk about today are going to be on room air, which is 21%. Now, when I factor in FIO2, I do it as a decimal. So 21% FIO2 equals point. 21. That's how I factor that in when I put it in my equation. It has to be point 21. All right. Well, let's look at that hypoxemia and what causes it. Here goes the alveolar air equation. So I'm going to give you some values, and I want you to plug it in and tell me what you got. It looks scarier than it is. Remember, we talked about respiratory quotient yesterday. What did we say, or the day before yesterday, what did we say respiratory quotient is? Yeah, what's the definition? What's the, de the definition? Carbon dioxide over the oxygen. So it's the unequal exchange of carbon dioxide produced to oxygen consumed. Okay, you got to be able to say that. The respiratory quotient is the unequal exchange of carbon dioxide produced from oxygen consumed. They don't, they're not the same. The amount of oxygen you use does not yield the same amount of CO2 that you produce. It's an unequal exchange. That's called the respiratory quotient. <clears throat> The unequal exchange of carbon dioxide produced to oxygen consumed. Right? That's the RQ. We said the normal RQ is what? What's the normal value for RQ? 0.8. Okay. So you know that. If I, if I just tell you to figure this out, you know that's 0.8. You gotta also find out the CO2 levels. We're gonna do all of that. Water pressure, P bar, and FO2, and then you got it. Okay, so I'm going to give you an ABG, and I want you to work out the problem for me. Mr. Smith is on room air. Okay, he has a PaCO2 of 50 millimeters of mercury. The P bar is 760 millimeters of mercury. The pressure of water is 47 millimeters of mercury. And RQ is 0 0.8. So change your CO2 to 40, because I want you to find out the normal P big A2 first. This, I'm a, when you figure this out, that's going to be the normal value for the alveolar air oxygen. So you can write that down. Okay, so PCO2 of 40 on room air, normal barometric pressure of 760, a normal water pressure at 47, and a normal respiratory quotient. I want you to tell me, what is the P big A O2, which is the alveolar air tension, which is in millimeters of mercury? Write it down in the chat. Now, remember, we said 
the normal, so you already know the normal CO2. What's the normal CO2 range? Oh, 35 to 45. 35 to 45. So perfect CO2 is right down the middle at what? 40. So that's a normal CO2. When you get it, put it in the chat for me. What is the alveolar oxygen tension? <sighs> Just plug these values in to here. Miss McCarthy is P bar and uh, the pH2O, are those supposed to be in decimal form? Oh, only thing in decimal that you have to change to a decimal is the FO2, because that's a percent. Okay. And the FO2 is room air, so room air is 21%, so that will be 0. 0.21, and the rest of them are just as you see. We're talking about the alveolar equation because we're trying to figure out what causes hypoxemia. The first thing is going to be a low alveolar oxygen tension. That's going to be the first reason or the first cause of hypoxemia. And so now we're figuring out how do we find out what that is to even know if it's low or not. That's what you're doing. This is the alveolar air equation. FO2 is a fraction of inspired oxygen. We learned on the other board that room air is 21% oxygen. So we're breathing or inspiring 21% oxygen right now, every last one of you. But that's written as a decimal when you put it into the formula. So plug it in and tell me what you get. put it in oh I ain't see no checks coming in let me see yeah charisma good uh Maria good Kelsey look at yours again Kelsey Lori good Shatara good Michael and good Talisha good can you look at it again Don't forget, guys, you must do what's in parentheses first. So when you're working it out, you need to do what's in parentheses. Follow your, uh, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. You can't just go start, you know, doing it the wrong way. You need to make sure you do what's in parentheses first. Then, of course, you do your multiplication, division, add, subtract, and all of that. Courtney good, Cassidy good. All right, let's work it out. All right, the answer should be rounded to 100 millimeters of mercury. That's the normal P big AO2, 100. That's what we're looking for. If they have that, that means that if your P big AO2 is 100 on room air, that means you have no disease process. There is no problem with diffusion. The oxygen that you took in, which was 21%, is readily transferring to the blood. It's going to go to the blood. So it got in the lungs. There is no shunting going on. There's not a whole lot of dead space. The oxygen that you took in is in the lungs. If it's not, then something's wrong. Okay, there's a disease process that's wrong. Okay, so the normal P big AO2 is 100 millimeters of mercury. Okay, now this number can be thrown off by a whole lot of CO2. It can be thrown off by 
uh, the barometric pressure. It could be thrown out by your respiratory quotient. So if something's not right, you won't get this 100. But this will be a brand new person. Perfect. Nothing wrong with them. No need for oxygen, right? They don't have no need for supplemental oxygen. Room air is enough. Okay? This is how you figure it out. You do P big A O2 equal 0.21 because they're on room air times 760 minus 47 minus CO2 is 40 divided by respiratory quotient 0 0.8. All right, we got to do what's in parentheses first. 760 minus 47 is 713 times 0.21, right? Minus 40 divided by eight is what? 40 divided by 0.8 is what? 50, okay? Now, let's do the multiplication before we do the subtraction. 0.21 times 713, okay? 149.73 minus 50. That gives you a P big A O2 of 99 point what? 73 or 100 millimeters of mercury. That's how you got it. You'll learn it's not big as it looks because the P bar and the water pressure are usually always the same. So that's always, that's usually always 713. And then a normal CO2 is 40, normal RQ is 0.8, so that's always going to be 50, right? But when things start changing, of course, you need to know how to do it. So let's look at another. All right. Same patient, and this time... The CO2 is 50, and his RQ is 1.2. Okay, let's do that. So we don't want. Point two one. And make sure you guys remember. So when you start doing these problems, they're not going to be bar. Felicia, uh, mute your mic. Oh. Now remember that when you get these problems, they're not going to necessarily give you all of these parameters. They're going to tell you. They may say, "What is the uh, do the alveolar equation with a CO two of fifty and uh, the patient on room air?" And that's all they say. If that's all they say, you got to know to use the normal values for the rest of it. Normal P bar is 760. Normal water pressure is 47. Normal CO2 will be 40. And normal RQ is 0.8. So if they don't give it to you, you got to know the normals to plug it in. So I'm going to work it out too and we'll see what we get. Charisma, you already worked it out? Is that new or is that old? Oh, Maria did too. Okay, they got the same thing. So that looks like that probably be it. Let me work it out right quick.
All right, yeah. So Talisha, good. That's all right. Kelsey, look at it again. We're gonna work this one out together, Kelsey. Talisha, good. Courtney, good. Uh, Heather, good. Cassidy, good. Is that? I think. I think that's Cassidy. Uh, Michaeline, good. Shakira, good. Charisma, look at it again. You and Maria are off a little bit. Miss Winston, what you get? Miss Winston, you with us? Uh, Yasmin, are you with us, Yasmin? All right, let's work it out. Answer should be 108, 108 millimeters of mercury. 108 millimeters of mercury. Now, you're usually not going to get more than 100. I'm just making up numbers, uh, but... This is how you should work it out. And on room air, so that's point 21 times P bar 760, water pressure 47, minus 50 for the CO2 divided by 1.2 RQ. All right, 760 minus 47 is 713 times point 21 minus 50 divided by 1.2 was 47. Well, 41.6. 41.6. This right here we know is 149, right? 0.73. When we multiply that, minus 41.6. 149.73 minus 41.6 is what? The big A02 of 108. Millimeters of mercury. Kelsey, are you seeing what you're doing wrong? I keep skipping a step and it's really making me mad. All right, just follow those steps just like I do. I bring it down, just bring it down. Don't try to... Uh, don't try to skip a step. Just like bring this part down and then go ahead and do that part, bring that down. And then do that, show me what I'm doing, right? And just breaking it down to the end answer. Charisma, you seeing what you got? You see what you did? You and uh, Heather and Maria. I think Heather had it right. Maria and Charisma, y'all see what y'all did wrong? I didn't subtract the oh, 462. I just left it at 149.73. <laughs> oh, okay. Who was this? Who was this? Brittany. Brittany, oh, okay. All right. So, yeah, just follow those steps, guys. Watch me do it when you go back and watch me break it down. And that's how you, that's how you do it. So that is the first way for us to know if the patient is suffering from hypoxemia, okay? Okay. All right, that's the first way to find out if our patient is hypoxemic or not, okay? So, um, uh, for It's going to start dropping with an increase in CO2, right? If, if you start having an increase in CO2, then it's going to start dropping. So say if my CO2 is 65 and my respiratory quotient is 0 0.8, right? If my CO2 is 65 and my respiratory quotient is 0.8, work, it, work one out one last time. 
and we're going to see uh, what that makes our PaO2 now. Take each step, one step at a time. All right, Michael, uh, you off just a little bit, but you probably only you probably didn't do the decimals or something. But Lori, good, Stephanie, good, Felicia, good, Shatara, good. Kenya, you off a little bit, Kenya. Heather, good. Courtney, good. Michael, you should, the answer should be 68.2 or 68.5. So your rounding, you would have been, that still wouldn't have been right. You should be down in the 68s. All right, so here it is. Okay, I got it this time. 0.21 times T bar 760 minus 47. Minus CO2 is 65 now. 65 divided by 0 0.8. This is 713 times 0.21 minus 65 divided by 0 0.8 is 81.2. So 81.2. That's what that is, right? So we know this is 149.73 minus 81.2. That gives us a D, big A, O2 of 68.5. Let's just say five millimeters of mercury. This is about to lead to hypoxemia. Because look at the CO2, guys. The CO2 is 65 in the lungs. So when the hemoglobin arrives at the lungs, what's she going to pick up? When hemoglobin makes it to the lung and finds out that the CO2 is 65, what's she going to pick up? Carbon dioxide. She's going to pick up the carbon dioxide, uh, yeah. right? So if she's picking up mostly carbon dioxide, that's going to lead to a low oxygen content in my blood because she ain't going to pick it up, okay? So that's going to lead to hypoxemia, a low alveolar air tension is the first cause of hypoxemia. If I don't get enough oxygen in my alveoli, then it can't transfer over into my artery because that's where it transpires at, right? In the alveoli. From the alveoli and the capillary, they exchange gas down in the parenchyma. So when our alveoli opens up, but it's uh, more CO2 in it than anything, then if it's low, then my arterial blood has nothing to pick up. So it's going to lead to a low oxygen content in my blood, which is hypoxemia. And things can call this like shallow breathing. If I'm barely breathing, then I'm not sucking in no oxygen in my alveoli. So that will cause a low P big AO2. An increase in CO2 can cause a low 
CaO2. Okay? All right. You okay, Gordon? What is the range for why, why is it low? What's the number? You want it to be 100. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's really not a range. You want it to be about 100. Because on, on room air and everything normal, it should be about 100. Okay? Now, if they're on oxygen, it's going to be higher than that. If they're on more oxygen than room air. Okay? That it would be higher than that. It can be really high. Because if, what if they're on 80% oxygen? Then that would be an FIO2 of 0.8. Right? And that's going to make the number larger. So but, you want the PaCO2 to be 100? No, you want the PaCO2 to be 40. Oh, okay. If, if PaCO2 is 40, that's normal. When everything is normal, then your PVAO2 should end up being 100. Okay. okay? Your arterial oxygen, I mean, your alveolar oxygen in the, in the pressure of alveolar oxygen should be 100, which is 99.73, I think that's what you get, which rounds to 100 millimeters of mercury. That's when everything is normal. Okay. Room air, CO2 of 40, P bar 760, H2O of 47, and an RQ of 0.8. Okay, so the 760 and the 47 are made? That's normal. Seven. That's the normal for P bar. That's the normal for pressure of water. Okay. Okay. Uh, normal RQ is 0.8, right? And normal CO2 would be what? 40. 40. And normal oxygen that you should be breathing in without any help is room air, which is 21%. Okay. okay. When you have all normals, you get a PaO2, a P big AO2 of 100. All right. When you get something less than that with normals, something's not right. All right. Something's not right. And you won't get it because unless they are barely breathing. Okay. Uh, but that's, that's how that works. All right, and if they're barely breathing, that means their CO2 is doing what? If somebody's barely breathing, then their CO2 is doing what? Not releasing. Not, no, I'm saying, is it building or going lower? If somebody's barely breathing, what's happening with the CO2 in your blood? It's building up because we exhale CO2. So if I'm barely breathing, then my CO2 is building and building and building, right? So that will cause this a low one because the co2 has went way up right because of shallow breathing so hypo ventilation can cause hypercarbia and hypercarbia is going to take away from your oxygenation because the hemoglobin say well hey you got co2 there i'd rather have that okay all right There we go. Can y'all see my screen? Say hypoxemia. Okay. Do a new share. Now you see hypoxemia. All right. So hypoxemia. Hypoxemia is deficiency of oxygen in the arterial blood. And the causes of it, number one cause will be decreased alveolar oxygen tension. And that's what you just did. The alveolar air equation, if it's lower than 100, then that's a decrease in the tension, right? That's one cause of hypoxemia. If you don't take the oxygen in, then you can't take it to your blood, okay? Number two, alveolar hypoventilation. If your alveoli is not ventilating well, you can't suck in the oxygen, okay? You can't suck in the oxygen if it's not ventilated. What's another one? What about a decreased hemoglobin saturation? Decreased hemoglobin saturation will cause uh, hypoxemia. And the hemoglobin doesn't pick up the oxygen if it's not there, right? If it's not there to pick up, then the hemoglobin is not going to be able to pick it up. So it's going to go back to the tissues low, okay? So if somebody's doing a lot of bleeding, their oxygen level will be dropping because they're losing blood. And what's in the blood? What's in the blood that carries the oxygen? The hemoglobin. hemoglobin. The most part, right? You can also dissolve in the plasma, but the most part is hemoglobin. And if you get shot or stabbed and start bleeding internally, your oxygen level is going to start plummeting 
because you're losing blood, okay? Or somebody who has low iron and stuff like that, that you can't, that iron attracts it. That's what attracts the oxygen, iron, it's metallic, right? You know, you say if somebody has low blood, they have to take iron tablets or iron supplements because the iron is what attracts the oxygen to the hemoglobin, right? Hemoglobin just don't go walking around picking it up. The hemoglobin has Fe, which is iron. And the iron is what attracts the oxygen, like a magnet. So if your iron is low, your blood is low, it doesn't pick up the oxygen like it's supposed to, which you end up being hypoxic. Okay? Yeah, they bruise easy because they don't have platelets. Not only do they not have the iron, but they don't have the platelets that are in the blood. Remember we say platelets are for clotting, right? So if you hit them, it's just blood everywhere. They don't have platelets. All right, so that's the second reason <clears throat> is hypo, high, uh, alveolar hypoventilation. The third reason was a decrease in hemoglobin saturation. Four is alveolar hypoventilation due to VQ abnormalities. Oh, going to the shunt. VQ mismatches can cause hypoxemia, right? For instance, you got all the blood, but there's no ventilation. That's a shunt. If you got a shunt, you're going to be hypoxic. If the blood leaves the right side of the heart and makes it back to the left without picking up oxygen, then your blood is going to be hypoxic. Okay? If it don't pick it up in the lungs, it can't pick it up nowhere else. Right? The lungs is the only place where the blood can pick up oxygen. So if it goes to, to the lungs and the lungs are closed, like the store, right? People come to the store, but the store is closed. It goes back home without your goods. Okay, you're gonna go back home void. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> when they're talking about alveolar hypoventilation due to VQ abnormalities, they're talking about intrapulmonary shunting, right? Blood going from the right to the left of the heart without picking up oxygenation. That's a shunt. Remember, perfusion and no ventilation is a shunt. So if my alveoli is high full ventilating, but I got plenty of perfusion, then that's a shunt, right? That's a shunt. And the shunt will cause hypoxemia. So the four causes of hypoxemia will be a decreased alveolar air tension from the alveolar equation, or simply just alveolar hypoventilation, decreased hemoglo hemoglobin saturation, or a shunt when they're shunting. All right, now, what does the body do to respond to hypoxemia? Simple, you're gonna breathe faster and you're gonna increase your cardiac output. When the body senses that the oxygen level is low, it's going to start making you breathe harder so you can suck more in, right? And it's going to increase the cardiac output. It's going to say, well, damn, maybe I'm not pumping out enough, right? Cardiac output, the normal cardiac output should be how much liters? Five liters. So instead of that five, it might start putting out six liters a minute to try to make up for the decrease in oxygen because the body wants to live no matter if you do or not. It's going to do whatever it needs to do to, to maintain homeostasis. So if the blood is what carries the oxygen and the body is finding out that it's hypoxic, then the body gonna say, okay, well, we gotta do something, right? I'm gonna make you breathe harder so you can suck more in, right? And I'm also going to make your heart pump harder to push out more cardiac output. So your heart rate is going to increase. Blood pressure may increase because it's pumping. instead of just pumping like this, and it's noticed that it's hypoxic, it's gonna start pumping a little harder. But it's gonna say it, the body needs it. The body don't care what you got going on. I need the oxygen. So if y'all not bringing the oxygen, somebody gotta do something. So the, the brain is gonna tell the, the uh, lungs, breathe harder because I need you to suck in more. And then they're gonna tell the heart to pump harder or faster to deliver more, okay? It's gonna start working together to try to make up for that deficiency in oxygen. Okay, now what are the four types of hypoxemia? The four types are hypoxic, anemic, stagnant, 
and histotoxic. The four types of hypoxemia are hyp hypoxic, anemic, stagnant, and histotoxic. Now they blend these in, guys, when they start telling you about how you get these hypoxias uh, as we talk about hypoxia, right? Remember, hypoxemia and hypoxia are different. Hypoxemia is lack of oxygen in the blood and hypoxia is lack of oxygen at the tissues, okay? So make sure you're able to answer that question. Hypoxemia, deficiency of oxygen in the arterial blood, that's emia. Remember, emia is blood, right? Okay, and hypoxia, just hypoxia, is decreased oxygen in the tissues. And now they're going to explain all four types of hypoxia. <clears throat> all four types of hypoxia. Number one, hypoxic hypoxia is also known as ambient hypoxia. That's just simply when the P little o, P, the P little a O2 is low. Simple as that. Hypoxic hypoxia is when the P little a O2 is low. That's the partial pressure of arterial oxygen. When it's low, that's simply hypoxic hypoxia, also known as ambient. All right. Number two, anemic hypoxia is also known as hemic, right? Hemic, anemic, that's blood. That's talking about the hemoglobin. When you have a decreased hemoglobin, that's considered to be anemic hypoxia, also known as hemic hypoxia. Now, this is special. This is also known as carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay. It can be because the hemoglobin is low or because guess who came home from jail? Who came home from jail? Carbon monoxide. And when he come around, guess what? She has no ability to set, accept oxygen anymore. When carbon monoxide is on deck, the hemoglobin has an inability to accept oxygen. She can't accept it because carbon monoxide is here. Okay. Now we learned that hemoglobin has 200 times more of love for carbon monoxide than it does oxygen. 200 times more. So when he come around, she she can't even. It's like walking around. You ever seen a kid walking around with toys in their hand, right? If they have their favorite toy in their hand and they're walking by you, you can try to hand them whatever. They gonna just walk by you. They have no more hands to pick it up. They, have the, they don't have the ability to pick up what you're trying to give them. I got what I want, okay? <clears throat> uh, like a football carrier. When a football runner, running back is running with the ball, he's not going to grab nothing else. You can't get to it. You have no ability to let go, all right? He's going to hold that ball for dear life, all right? Now, that's called anemic hypoxia, either because the hemoglobin is low because of a menstrual cycle the hemoglobin is low because of the platelets or some kind of low count, right? Or because of hemophiliac, somebody who's a hemophiliac. Or if they're bleeding, you got cut, now you're bleeding, you're, you're hemorrhaging. If you're hemorrhaging, those can be, those are all uh, hypoxia due to the hemoglobin, right? So if your hemoglobin is low, that's anemic hypoxia. Or if you get carbon monoxide poisoning, that's also considered anemic hypoxia because it's a problem with the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin can't hold oxygen because carbon monoxide is on deck. So it's a hemoglobin problem, okay? Now, <clears throat> there are some normal hemoglobin amounts, a uh, 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 normal carbon monoxide amount, because we live in a combustible fossil fuel world. The world is made of carbon, right? And so we burn carbon all the time, wood burning or whatever. 
uh, it's going to be naturally in your system. Okay. So the normal HBCO, look at this HBCO, that is carboxyhemoglobin. HBCO is carboxyhemoglobin. There is How do you spell that? So I think that was the customer's number. Car carboxy hemoglobin, carboxy, and then hemoglobin. I think it's C A C A R B O X Y hemoglobin. I think I'm not the spiller. I told y'all that. But carboxy hemoglobin is normal living on Earth. Okay, zero point five percent should be your normal carboxy hemoglobin amount. If I was to test your blood. Right, and do a coox, and not just an ABG, but a special ABG to find out how much carbon monoxide is actually on your blood. It should be about 0.5%, okay? 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.3, something like that, around that area, that's normal. All right, but what if you smoke? Somebody who smokes cigarettes, they have a five to 10% carbon monoxide in their blood, just from smoking. And then 40% can kill you. So it ain't that far away from smoking, okay? After you smoke, <clears throat> your carboxyhemoglobin amount is about five to 10%. But then if you are in a house fire, it will raise between 40 to 60% and kill you if you don't get out, okay? So that's the... carbon monoxide that comes from burning yeah burning couches and all of that stuff yep no you can get carbon monoxide poisoning from your water heater not acting right it doesn't have to be smoke it could be just you could have a million dollar home and your water heater is not filtering out like it should they have a spout on your water heater that goes out of the house okay if it's not working right, that carbon monoxide will start to build up in the house. And that's why it kills you while you're sleeping because it lays low to the floor. So the first person it hits is people that's laying in the what? In the bed. And you can't smell it, you can't taste it, you can't see it. You just wake up dead, okay? The whole house is dead. They went down, what happened? Everybody in there knocked out, snuggled right in their little bed, dead. Okay. Or you wake up from upstairs, you come downstairs in your kid's bedroom, they dead. Okay. That's what happened. That's why you need a, a what? Carbon monoxide detector in your home. And when you put it in your home, put it low around bed level. Don't put it up in the, in the top of the top of the hallway because it's going to kill you before it reaches that. Get it low where it's going to go off as soon as it, it reads it low to the ground. You need to wake up okay, and get out the house. All right, that's why, yeah, question. So is it carbon monoxide in cigarette smoke as well? Yes. Oh. Uh, and that's why people, uh, when they try to kill themselves, they start the car and go in the garage and shut the garage and put the windows down. Your car is burning carbon monoxide. So they let the window down and just sit there and watch a little TV or whatever and fall asleep, dead. Okay, that's why they do that because they have it's not ventilated, it's all building up in the garage. So that's why you don't have your car running in your garage trying to listen to music or doing something. You got the car running, that exhaust is carbon monoxide, it will kill you. You just get sleepy and fall out. Okay, so that's the second type of hypoxia. First type was hypoxemic, which is just a low PaO2. Number two was anemic, which is a problem with the hemoglobin, right? Either the hemoglobin is low from bleeding or you have come in contact with carbon monoxide, okay? The number three is stagnant hypoxia, also known as circulatory. If your blood is not circulating well because of a low cardiac output, that's called stagnant. When something's stagnant, it's kind of just stale or sitting still, right? You've seen those ponds or those fountains where people have an apartment and they have a beautiful fountain in the front yard and it's the water's moving but if the fountain goes off the water sits still and it starts to just build up mosquitoes and algae and all kind of stuff is stagnant okay 
So your blood, because of your cardiac output, if it's lower than five, you could suffer from circulatory or stagnant hypoxia because it's not getting the blood to your body like it's supposed to, right? And that can happen because of a heart attack that you've had or congestive heart failure, anything that can cause the left side of the heart to not be functioning properly, right? Because we know that the left side is the systemic side, right? That's the side that pushes it to the body. So if it's been attacked or necrotic or ischemia, anything that has caused that muscle to get weak, then you're going to have a circulation problem, perfusion problem. And that's when we did the, then we do the finger pinch check, talk about the finger pinch check. So you can see your, uh, your uh, circulation by simple finger uh, pinch check. All right. So stagnant is also known as circulatory. And that's because the heart is unable to deliver that blood. It could be full of oxygen, but if the pressure is low or the cardiac output is low, it's going to not get to you. Okay. And the last one is histotoxic. This only happens from cyanide poisoning. Histotoxic hypoxia is from cyanide poisoning. Once you inhale cyanide, your cells can't use oxygen ever again. Every cell in your body is unable to use oxygen. So a lot of criminals, when they get caught, they pop a cyanide pill. They swallow that, it's over. Cyanide poison will kill you. Okay, you put cyanide in people's, people put cyanide in people's watering towers at work. They come and drop a cyanide pill or something in there because they're being devious to kill everybody who drink out of it or in the coffee, the coffee uh, container. Uh, you can give cyanide in your drink for your spouse or something like that, and you'll never know what's wrong with them. Especially if they have well, other they can't trace it. Huh? They can't trace it. If they look for it, oh. if, they have, if they have a reason to believe that's what it is, then they can look for it. But if they don't have no reason to even think that, if you already got problems, they ain't going to look for it. So where do you find cyanide? Is that like a common thing you can buy? I, I don't know. I, I guess you can buy it if you, they use cyanide for different things though. They do use cyanide for, um, they used to use it for separating gold from uh, other iron back in the day. Um, they used to have those uh, people who were doing a lot of gold chasing and they used to use a uh, chemical like cyanide. They could put it with the metals and it would separate the gold from the iron but that was killing people that wasn't protecting themselves, right? So they outlawed that. Back in the 1800s, they outlawed the use of cyanide. But I think they use it in pool chemicals. I think I think cyanide is used in certain pool as a pool chemical. So you just have to be careful, uh, but you will have to have a license to buy it. Okay, you, know, you can't just anybody go get no cyanide. All right. We're going to talk about the results of this hypoxemia, and then we're going to stop. What happens if you are hypoxic? So right now we've learned that oxygen is transported in two ways, either dissolved in the plasma or combined to the hemoglobin. We talked about the oxyhemoglobin curve and what happens when it shifts to the left and to the right, right? We talked about then we got into hypoxemia, which is low oxygen in the arterial blood. And then we talked about basic hypoxia, which is low oxygen at the tissues and the types, right? We learned the four types of hypoxia. And so now, where do we go from here? What, we talked about what the body does in response to hypoxemia, right? We talked about what the body will do. It's gonna make you breathe harder or make the heart pump faster, okay? Now, but even though your body's responding to this low oxygen, there is a consequence of hypoxemia because the body is going to continue to metabolize whether you use an oxygen or not, right? So what do we say is the byproduct of glucose and sugar burning uh, and oxygen? When we burn oxygen and sugar with our carbohydrates, it produces what? The byproduct of metabolism is CO2. CO2. CO2 is the byproduct of metabolism. Regular 
uh, aerobic metabolism. Aerobic means with oxygen, right? Aerobic means with oxygen. When we use oxygen and we burn it with the RQ, talking about the arc respiratory quotient, oxygen consumed and CO2 produced, right? When we start burning uh, glucose and oxygen in our normal metabolism, we produce CO2, which is okay. We send it to the lungs to be expelled, okay? But what if you don't have that oxygen to burn? You want to start burning CO2 instead. So that's called anaerobic metabolism, okay? You're going to knock on the body. So I got I to have something, right? So if you don't have the oxygen for me to burn, I'll burn the CO2. Just like if you don't eat for days. If you don't take in fat, the body will start burning the fat that's already there, right? It's going to continue to metabolize regardless if you're trying to or not. So if you don't have the oxygen for aerobic metabolism, it's going to start burning CO2. And that's called anaerobic metabolism, and that produces lactic acid. That produces lactic, lactic acid, which is a byproduct of CO2 metabolism, which is anaerobic. Anaerobic means without oxygen. If the body starts burning CO2 and glucose, that's going to produce lactic acid, which will cause you to go into septic shock. Septic shock will kill you. What do you say? You know, just don't mess with them, man. That's all. No. Okay. Man, they're going to take care of it. I got to go. They're going to take care of it. That's fraud. They'll take care of it. So don't let it sweat it. You can't trust them. That's all these to it. I got to go. All right. The byproduct of anaerobic metabolism, guys, is lactic acid. And the production of lactic acid will go will cause the patient to go into septic shock, which can kill you if we don't fix it. So how do we fix it? We give them some oxygen. Okay? We can we can forfeit all of this problem by giving them some supplemental oxygen, whether it's the oxygen that goes in the nose, whether it's a mask, whether it's a whole tube down their throat, whatever we got to do to get the oxygen pumping through the blood to prevent them going into septic shock. Okay, so if you don't have oxygen, you see it will lead to death. Okay, it will eventually lead to death. And I'm going to stop there. For today, tomorrow we're going to talk about alveolar oxygen, the alveolar arterial difference. That's the uh, pressure of alveolar minus the arterial oxygen. Remember I told you, if you have the oxygen in the alveoli, it should go right into the capillary, the blood, right? But sometimes there are diffusion defects. The type 1 cell can be have a disease process, and that oxygen that's in the alveoli does not get into the arterial blood. And that's a gap called the gradient, the AA gradient, the difference between one and the other. It should not be a long period. It should be just like 10 to 15 difference. That's it. If it's, if the difference between the two is 50 and 60 millimeters of mercury, something ain't right. There's a disease process with the alveoli that's causing the oxygen not to transfuse into the seal, um, into the capillary. Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about on tomorrow, okay? Tonight's homework. This is going to be the homework right here tonight. I'm going to put it in there. I want you to do homework number one and not this one, this one.
homework number one, and you're going to do this worksheet, both worksheets for tonight. How is oxygen carried? Write the total O2 content equation. What is P50? What's the normal value? When it says normal value, I want to know what the PaO2 is at P50. Oh, okay. Let me show you what the homework is. This is the homework. You're going to do homework number one and this worksheet. Okay. How is oxygen carried? What is the total O2 content equation? What is P50? And then what is its normal value? When it says normal value, I want to know what the P little AO2 is at P50. We talked about that. A shift to the right in the, in the curve causes what? Uh, what four things cause a shift to the left? What is hypoxemia? Write out the alveolar equation and what is hypoxia? Those, that's your homework. Now, right here it says three decrease and one increases. That's I want to know that the, the uh, uh, decrease, all four of them decrease. That right there is the uh, when it talked about the um, uh, hydrogen ion. The hydrogen ion goes down with the temperature and all the other stuff. Those four go down, but the pH goes up. When the hydrogen ions go down, pH goes up. When hydrogen ions go up, pH goes down. So that's what they're trying to say right there. I'm going to take that out. Don't worry about that. I want to know what four things cause a shift to the left. Right? It's four things. It's four things that go, go up or down. You got to tell me. Okay? Like four things that go up or down. But that's going to be the homework. Homework number one and this right here. After I get through getting off this class, I'm going to load both of these up for you to... Uh, get started on that will be the homework is okay. that on the module already because i don't see it is what on the module what i just showed that you? uh There's yeah that iPod paper iPad charger and oh, charger i'm gonna load it up it looks similar to homework number four is that the same thing it might be i don't know but i'm gonna load it up okay. i'm gonna do number one and that one right there tonight okay. have a good day i'm about to load the homework and i'll see you tomorrow